Geoffrey Chaucer, c. 1343 to 25 October 1400, was an English poet and author. Widely considered the greatest English poet of the Middle Ages, he is best known for the Canterbury Tales. Chaucer has been styled the father of English literature and was the first writer buried in Poet's Corner of Westminster Abbey. Chaucer also achieved fame in his lifetime as a philosopher and astronomer, composing the scientific A treatise on the astrolabe for his ten year old son Lewis. He maintained an active career in the civil service as a bureaucrat, courtier and diplomat. Among Chaucer's many other works are The Book of the Duchess, The House of Fame, The Legend of Good Women, and Troilus and Chryside. He is seen as crucial in legitimizing the literary use of the Middle English vernacular at a time when the dominant literary languages in England were still French and Latin. Topic. Origin Chaucer was born in London sometime around 1343, though the precise date and location remain unknown. His father and grandfather were both London vintners, and several previous generations had been merchants in Ipswich. His family name is derived from the French Chaucer, meaning shoemaker. In 1324, his father John Chaucer was kidnapped by an aunt in the hope of marrying the 12-year-old to her daughter in an attempt to keep property in Ipswich. The aunt was imprisoned and fined £250, equivalent to £184,121 in 2018, which suggests that the family was financially secure. John Chaucer married Agnes Copton, who inherited properties in 1349, including 24 shops in London from her uncle Homo de Copton, who is described in a will dated 3 April 1354 and listed in the city hustings role as moneyer said to be moneyer at the Tower of London. In the City Hustings Roll 110, 5, Rick 2, dated June 1380, Chaucer refers to himself as me Galfordum Chaucer, Philium Johannes Chaucer, Vinitory, Londony, which translates into modern English essentially as Geoffrey Chaucer, son of John Chaucer, Vintner, London. Topic. Career While records concerning the lives of his contemporary friends, William Langland and the Pearl Poet, are practically non-existent, since Chaucer was a public servant, his official life is very well documented, with nearly 500 written items testifying to his career. The first of the Chaucer Life Records Appears in 1357, in the household accounts of Elizabeth de Berg, the Countess of Ulster, when he became the noblewoman's page through his father's connections, a common medieval form of apprenticeship for boys into knighthood or prestige appointments. The Countess was married to Lionel, Duke of Clarence, the second surviving son of the King, Edward III, and the position brought the teenage Chaucer into the close court circle, where he was to remain for the rest of his life. He also worked as a courtier, a diplomat, and a civil servant, as well as working for the king from 1389 to 1391 as clerk of the king's works. In 1359, in the early stages of the Hundred Years' War, Edward III invaded France and Chaucer travelled with Lionel of Antwerp, first Duke of Clarence, Elizabeth's husband, as part of the English army. In 1360, he was captured during the Siege of Reims. Edward paid £16 for his ransom, a considerable sum, and Chaucer was released. After this, Chaucer's life is uncertain, but he seems to have travelled in France, Spain, and Flanders, possibly as a messenger and perhaps even going on a pilgrimage to Santiago de Compostela. Around 1366, Chaucer married Philippa de Rowett. She was a lady-in-waiting to Edward III's queen, Philippa of Hainaut, and a sister of Catherine Swinford, who later c. 1396, became the third wife of John of Gaunt. It is uncertain how many children Chaucer and Philippa had, but three or four are most commonly cited. 
His son, Thomas Chaucer, had an illustrious career, as chief butler to four kings, envoy to France, and speaker of the House of Commons. Thomas's daughter, Alice, married the Duke of Suffolk. Thomas's great-grandson, Geoffrey's great-great-grandson, John de la Pole, Earl of Lincoln, was the heir to the throne designated by Richard III before he was deposed. Geoffrey's other children probably included Elizabeth Chaucy, a nun at Barking Abbey, Agnes, an attendant at Henry IV's coronation, and another son, Louis Chaucer. Chaucer's Treatise on the Astrolabe was written for Lewis. According to tradition, Chaucer studied law in the Inner Temple and Inn of Court at this time. He became a member of the royal court of Edward III as a valet de chambre, yeoman, or esquire on 20 June 1367, a position which could entail a wide variety of tasks. His wife also received a pension for court employment. He traveled abroad many times, at least some of them in his role as a valet. In 1368, he may have attended the wedding of Lionel of Antwerp to Violante Visconti, daughter of Galeazzo II Visconti, in Milan. Two other literary stars of the era were in attendance, Jean Froissart and Petrarch. Around this time, Chaucer is believed to have written the Book of the Duchess in honor of Blanche of Lancaster, the late wife of John of Gaunt, who died in 1369 of the plague. Chaucer traveled to Picardy the next year as part of a military expedition. In 1373, he visited Genoa and Florence. Numerous scholars such as Skeet, Boitani, and Roland suggested that, on this Italian trip, he came into contact with Petrarch or Boccaccio. They introduced him to medieval Italian poetry, the forms and stories of which he would use later. The purposes of a voyage in 1377 are mysterious, as details within the historical record conflict. Later documents suggest it was a mission, along with Jean Froissart, to arrange a marriage between the future King Richard II and a French princess, thereby ending the Hundred Years' War. If this was the purpose of their trip, they seem to have been unsuccessful, as no wedding occurred. In 1378, Richard II sent Chaucer as an envoy secret dispatch to the Visconti and to Sir John Hawkwood, English condottier mercenary leader, in Milan. It has been speculated that it was Hawkwood on whom Chaucer based his character The Knight in the Canterbury Tales, for a description matches that of a 14th-century condottier. A possible indication that his career as a writer was appreciated came when Edward III granted Chaucer a gallon of wine daily for the rest of his life for some unspecified task. This was an unusual grant, but given on a day of celebration, St. George's Day, 1374, when artistic endeavors were traditionally rewarded, it is assumed to have been another early poetic work. It is not known which, if any, of Chaucer's extant works prompted the reward, but the suggestion of him as poet to a king places him as a precursor to later poets laureate. Chaucer continued to collect the liquid stipend until Richard II came to power, after which it was converted to a monetary grant on 18 April 1378. Chaucer obtained the very substantial job of controller of the customs for the Port of London, which he began on 8 June 1374. He must have been suited for the role as he continued in it for twelve years, a long time in such a post at that time. His life goes undocumented for much of the next ten years, but it is believed that he wrote, or began, most of his famous works during this period. He was mentioned in law papers of 4 May 1380, involved in the raptus, rape or seizure, of Cecilia Champagne. What was meant is unclear, but the incident seems to have been resolved quickly with an exchange of money in June 1380 and did not leave a stain on Chaucer's reputation. It is not known if Chaucer was in the city of London at the time of the Peasants' Revolt, but if he was, he would have seen its leaders pass almost directly under his apartment window at Aldgate. While still working as controller, Chaucer appears to have moved to Kent, being appointed as one of the commissioners of peace for Kent, at a time when French invasion was a possibility. 
He is thought to have started work on the Canterbury Tales in the early 1380s. He also became a member of Parliament for Kent in 1386, and attended the Wonderful Parliament that year. He appears to have been present at most of the 71 days it sat, for which he was paid £24.9. On 15 October that year, he gave a deposition in the case of Scrope v. Grosvenor. There is no further reference after this date to Philippa, Chaucer's wife, and she is presumed to have died in 1387. He survived the political upheavals caused by the Lord's appellants, despite the fact that Chaucer knew some of the men executed over the affair quite well. On 12 July 1389, Chaucer was appointed the Clerk of the King's Works, a sort of foreman organizing most of the King's building projects. No major works were begun during his tenure, but he did conduct repairs on Westminster Palace, St. George's Chapel, Windsor, continue building the wharf at the Tower of London, and build the stands for a tournament held in 1390. It may have been a difficult job, but it paid well, two shillings a day, more than three times his salary as a controller. Chaucer was also appointed Keeper of the Lodge at the King's Park in Feckenham, which was a largely honorary appointment. Topic. Later life In September 1390, records say that Chaucer was robbed and possibly injured while conducting the business, and he stopped working in this capacity on 17 June 1391. He began as deputy forester in the Royal Forest of Petherton Park in North Petherton, Somerset on the 22nd of June. This was no sinecure, with maintenance an important part of the job, although there were many opportunities to derive profit. Richard II granted him an annual pension of £20 in 1394, and Chaucer's name fades from the historical record not long after Richard's overthrow in 1399. The last few records of his life show his pension renewed by the new king, and his taking a lease on a residence within the close of Westminster Abbey on 24 December 1399. Henry IV renewed the grants assigned by Richard, but the complaint of Chaucer to his purse hints that the grants might not have been paid. The last mention of Chaucer is on 5 June 1400 when some money was paid which was owed to him. Chaucer died of unknown causes on 25 October 1400, although the only evidence for this date comes from the engraving on his tomb which was erected more than 100 years after his death. There is some speculation that he was murdered by enemies of Richard II or even on the orders of his successor Henry IV, but the case is entirely circumstantial. Chaucer was buried in Westminster Abbey in London, as was his right owing to his status as a tenant of the Abbey's close. In 1556, his remains were transferred to a more ornate tomb, making him the first writer interred in the area now known as Poet's Corner. Topic. Relationship to John of Gaunt Chaucer was a close friend of John of Gaunt, the wealthy Duke of Lancaster and father of Henry IV, and he served under Lancaster's patronage. Near the end of their lives, Lancaster and Chaucer became brothers-in-law when Chaucer married Philippa Pan de Rowett in 1366, and Lancaster married Philippa's sister Catherine Swinford de Rowett in 1396. Chaucer's book of the Duchess, also known as the Death of Blanche the Duchess, was written in commemoration of Blanche of Lancaster, John of Gaunt's first wife. The poem refers to John and Blanche in allegory as the narrator relates the tale of A long castell with walls white, be Saint Johann, on a Reich hill. 1318-1319 Who is mourning grievously after the death of his love? And good fair white she het, that was my lady name right. 948-949 The phrase, long castell is a reference to Lancaster, also called Loncastel, and Loncastel. Walls White is thought to be an oblique reference to Blanche. 
Saint Johann was John of Gaunt's name saint, and Reich Hill is a reference to Richmond. These references reveal the identity of the grieving Black Knight of the poem as John of Gaunt, Duke of Lancaster and Earl of Richmond. White is the English translation of the French word Blanche, implying that the White Lady was Blanche of Lancaster. Chaucer's short poem Fortune, believed to have been written in the 1390s, is also thought to refer to Lancaster. Chaucer as narrator openly defies fortune, proclaiming that he has learned who his enemies are through her tyranny and deceit, and declares, My suffisance, 15, and that, Over himself hath the maestry, 14. Fortune, in turn, does not understand Chaucer's harsh words to her for she believes that she has been kind to him, claims that he does not know what she has in store for him in the future, but most importantly, and eat thou hast thy best a friend alive. 32, 40, 48. Chaucer retorts, My friend mazed how nat reven, blind goddess. 50, and orders her to take away those who merely pretend to be his friends. Fortune turns her attention to three princes whom she implores to relieve Chaucer of his pain and prayeth his best a friend of his noblesse, that to some beater a stat he may attend. 78 to 79 the three princes are believed to represent the dukes of lancaster york and gloucester and a portion of line 76 as three of you or twain is thought to refer to the ordinance of 1390 which specified that no royal gift could be authorized without the consent of at least two of the three dukes most conspicuous in this short poem is the number of references to chaucer's best a friend Fortune states three times in her response to the plaintiff, and also, you still have your best friend alive. 32, 40, 48, she also refers to his best a friend in the envoy when appealing to his noblesse to help Chaucer to a higher estate. The narrator makes a fifth reference when he rails at Fortune that she shall not take his friend from him. Topic. Religious beliefs Chaucer's attitudes toward the Church should not be confused with his attitudes toward Christianity. He seems to have respected and admired Christians and to have been one himself, though he also recognized that many people in the Church were venal and corrupt. He writes in Canterbury Tales, Now I beg all those that listen to this little treatise, or read it, that if there be anything in it that pleases them, they thank our Lord Jesus Christ for it, from whom proceeds all understanding and goodness. Topic. Literary works Chaucer's first major work was The Book of the Duchess, an elegy for Blanche of Lancaster who died in 1368. Two other early works were Annalita and Arcite and the House of Fame. He wrote many of his major works in a prolific period when he held the job of Customs Controller for London, 1374-1386. His Parliament of Fowls, The Legend of Good Women, and Troilus and Chryside all date from this time. It is believed that he started the Canterbury Tales in the 1380s. Chaucer also translated Boethius' Consolation of Philosophy and the Romance of the Rose by Guillaume de Loris, extended by Jean de Mun. Eustache Deschamps called himself a nettle in Chaucer's garden of poetry. In 1385, Thomas U.S.K. made glowing mention of Chaucer, and John Gower also lauded him. Chaucer's treatise on the astrolabe describes the form and use of the astrolabe in detail and is sometimes cited as the first example of technical writing in the English language, and it indicates that Chaucer was versed in science in addition to his literary talents. Equatory of the Planetas is a scientific work which was discovered in 1952. It has language and handwriting similar to Chaucer's and it continues many of the ideas from the astrolabe. It also contains an example of early European encryption. However, it is still uncertain whether or not the work can be attributed to Chaucer. <laughs> 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 
Topic: Influence. Topic: Linguistic. Chaucer wrote in continental accentual syllabic meter, a style which had developed since around the 12th century as an alternative to the alliterative Anglo-Saxon meter. Chaucer is known for metrical innovation, inventing the rhyme royal, and he was one of the first English poets to use the five stress line, a decasyllabic cousin to the iambic pentameter, in his work, with only a few anonymous short works using it before him. The arrangement of these five stress lines into rhyming couplets, first seen in his The Legend of Good Women, was used in much of his later work and became one of the standard poetic forms in English. His early influence as a satirist is also important, with the common humorous device, the funny accent of a regional dialect, apparently making its first appearance in the Reeves' tale. The poetry of Chaucer, along with other writers of the era, is credited with helping to standardize the London dialect of the Middle English language from a combination of the Kentish and Midlands dialects. This is probably overstated, the influence of the court, chancery and bureaucracy, of which Chaucer was a part, remains a more probable influence on the development of standard English. Modern English is somewhat distanced from the language of Chaucer's poems owing to the effect of the great vowel shift some time after his death. This change in the pronunciation of English, still not fully understood, makes the reading of Chaucer difficult for the modern audience. The status of the final E in Chaucer's verse is uncertain, it seems likely that during the period of Chaucer's writing the final E was dropping out of colloquial English and that its use was somewhat irregular. Chaucer's versification suggests that the final E is sometimes to be vocalized, and sometimes to be silent, however, this remains a point on which there is disagreement. When it is vocalized, most scholars pronounce it as a schwa. Apart from the irregular spelling, much of the vocabulary is recognizable to the modern reader. Chaucer is also recorded in the Oxford English Dictionary as the first author to use many common English words in his writings. These words were probably frequently used in the language at the time but Chaucer, with his ear for common speech, is the earliest extant manuscript source. Acceptable, alkali, altercation, amble, angrily, annex, annoyance, approaching, arbitration, armless, army, arrogant, arsenic, arc, artillery and aspect are just some of the many English words first attested in Chaucer. Topic. Literary Widespread knowledge of Chaucer's works is attested by the many poets who imitated or responded to his writing. John Lydgate was one of the earliest poets to write continuations of Chaucer's unfinished tales while Robert Henryson's Testament of Cressid completes the story of Cressida left unfinished in his Troilus and Chryside. Many of the manuscripts of Chaucer's works contain material from these poets and later appreciations by the Romantic era poets were shaped by their failure to distinguish the later editions from original Chaucer. Writers of the 17th and 18th centuries, such as John Dryden, admired Chaucer for his stories, but not for his rhythm and rhyme, as few critics could then read Middle English and the text had been butchered by printers, leaving a somewhat unadmirable mess. It was not until the late 19th century that the official Chaucerian canon, accepted today, was decided upon, largely as a result of Walter William Skeet's work. Roughly 75 years after Chaucer's death, The Canterbury Tales was selected by William Caxton to be one of the first books to be printed in England. Topic. English. Chaucer is sometimes considered the source of the English vernacular tradition. His achievement for the language can be seen as part of a general historical trend towards the creation of a vernacular literature, after the example of Dante, in many parts of Europe. 
A parallel trend in Chaucer's own lifetime was underway in Scotland through the work of his slightly earlier contemporary, John Barber, and was likely to have been even more general, as is evidenced by the example of the Pearl Poet in the north of England. Although Chaucer's language is much closer to modern English than the text of Beowulf, such that unlike that of Beowulf, a modern English speaker with a large vocabulary of archaic words may understand it, it differs enough that most publications modernize his idiom. The following is a sample from the prologue of the Summoner's Tale that compares Chaucer's text to a modern translation. Topic. Critical reception <laughs> Topic. Early criticism The poet Thomas Hockleave, who may have met Chaucer and considered him his role model, hailed Chaucer as the first day findier of our fair language. John Lydgate referred to Chaucer within his own text The Fall of Princes as the Load stare, off our language. Around two centuries later, Sir Philip Sidney greatly praised Troilus and Chryside in his own defense of poesy. Topic. Manuscripts and audience The large number of surviving manuscripts of Chaucer's works is testimony to the enduring interest in his poetry prior to the arrival of the printing press. There are 83 surviving manuscripts of the Canterbury Tales in whole or part alone, along with 16 of Troilus and Chryside, including the personal copy of Henry IV. Given the ravages of time, it is likely that these surviving manuscripts represent hundreds since lost. Chaucer's original audience was a courtly one, and would have included women as well as men of the upper social classes. Yet even before his death in 1400, Chaucer's audience had begun to include members of the rising literate, middle and merchant classes, which included many Lollard sympathizers who may well have been inclined to read Chaucer as one of their own, particularly in his satirical writings about friars, priests, and other church officials. In 1464, John Barron, a tenant farmer in Agmundesham, was brought before John Chadworth, the Bishop of Lincoln, on charges he was a Lollard heretic. He confessed to owning a Boke of the Tales of Canterbury, among other suspect volumes. <laughs> Topic. Printed editions William Caxton, the first English printer, was responsible for the first two folio editions of the Canterbury Tales which were published in 1478 and 1483. Caxton's second printing, by his own account, came about because a customer complained that the printed text differed from a manuscript he knew. Caxton obligingly used the man's manuscript as his source. Both Caxton editions carry the equivalent of manuscript authority. Caxton's edition was reprinted by his successor, Wynkin de Word, but this edition has no independent authority. Richard Pinson, the King's printer under Henry VIII for about 20 years, was the first to collect and sell something that resembled an edition of the collected works of Chaucer. However, in the process, he introduced five previously printed texts that are now known not to be Chaucer's. The collection is actually three separately printed texts, or collections of texts, bound together as one volume. There is a likely connection between Pinson's product and William Thin's a mere six years later. Thin had a successful career from the 1520s until his death in 1546, as chief clerk of the kitchen of Henry VIII, one of the masters of the royal household. He spent years comparing various versions of Chaucer's works, and selected 41 pieces for publication. While there were questions over the authorship of some of the material, there is not doubt this was the first comprehensive view of Chaucer's work. The works of Geoffrey Chaucer, published in 1532, was the first edition of Chaucer's collected works. His editions of Chaucer's works in 1532 and 1542 were the first major contributions to the existence of a widely recognized Chaucerian canon. 
Thin represents his edition as a book sponsored by and supportive of the king who is praised in the preface by Sir Brian Tuke. Thin's canon brought the number of apocryphal works associated with Chaucer to a total of 28, even if that was not his intention. As with Pinson, once included in the works, pseudepigraphic texts stayed with those works, regardless of their first editor's intentions. In the 16th and 17th centuries, Chaucer was printed more than any other English author, and he was the first author to have his works collected in comprehensive single-volume editions in which a Chaucer canon began to cohere. Some scholars contend that 16th-century editions of Chaucer's works set the precedent for all other English authors in terms of presentation, prestige and success in print. These editions certainly established Chaucer's reputation, but they also began the complicated process of reconstructing and frequently inventing Chaucer's biography and the canonical list of works which were attributed to him. Probably the most significant aspect of the growing Apocrypha is that, beginning with Thin's editions, it began to include medieval texts that made Chaucer appear as a proto-Protestant Lollard, primarily the Testament of Love and the Plowman's Tale. As Chaucerian works that were not considered apocryphal until the late 19th century, these medieval texts enjoyed a new life, with English Protestants carrying on the earlier Lollard project of appropriating existing texts and authors who seemed sympathetic or malleable enough to be construed as sympathetic to their cause. The official Chaucer of the early printed volumes of his works was construed as a proto-Protestant as the same was done, concurrently, with William Langland and Piers Plowman. The famous Plowman's Tale did not enter Thin's works until the second, 1542, edition. Its entry was surely facilitated by Thin's inclusion of Thomas Usk's Testament of Love in the first edition. The Testament of Love imitates, borrows from, and thus resembles Usk's contemporary, Chaucer. Testament of Love also appears to borrow from Piers Plowman, since the Testament of Love mentions its author's part in a failed plot, Book 1, Chapter 6, His Imprisonment, and, perhaps, a recantation of possibly Lollard, heresy, all this was associated with Chaucer. U.S.K. himself was executed as a traitor in 1388. John Fox took this recantation of heresy as a defense of the true faith, calling Chaucer a right Wycliffean and erroneously identifying him as a schoolmate and close friend of John Wycliffe at Merton College, Oxford. Thomas Specht is careful to highlight these facts in his editions and his Life of Chaucer. No other sources for the Testament of Love exist. There is only Thin's construction of whatever manuscript sources he had. John Stowe (1525–1605) was an antiquarian and also a chronicler. His edition of Chaucer's works in 1561 brought the Apocrypha to more than 50 titles. More were added in the 17th century, and they remained as late as 1810, well after Thomas Tyrwhitt pared the canon down in his 1775 edition. The compilation and printing of Chaucer's works was, from its beginning, a political enterprise, since it was intended to establish an English national identity and history that grounded and authorized the Tudor monarchy and church. What was added to Chaucer often helped represent him favorably to Protestant England. In his 1598 edition of the works, Specht, probably taking cues from Fox, made good use of Usk's account of his political intrigue and imprisonment in the Testament of Love to assemble a largely fictional life of our learned English poet, Geoffrey Chaucer. Specht's life presents readers with an erstwhile radical in troubled times much like their own, a proto-Protestant who eventually came round to the king's views on religion. Specht states, In the second year of Richard II, the king took Geoffrey Chaucer and his lands into his protection. The occasion whereof no doubt was some donger and trouble whereinto he was fallen by favoring some rash attempt of the common people. Under the discussion of Chaucer's friends, namely John of Gaunt, Specht further explains, 
yet it seemeth that Chaucer was in some trouble in the days of King Richard II, as it may appear in the Testament of Lou, where he doth greatly complain of his own rashness in following the multitude, and of their hatred against him for bereaying their purpose. And in that complaint which he maketh to his empty purse, I do find a written copy, which I had of Iohn Stowe, whose library hath helped many writers, wherein ten times more is adoined, than is in print. Where he maketh great lamentation for his wrongful imprisonment, wishing death to end his days, which in my judgment doth greatly accord with that in the testament of Lou. Moriour we find it thus in record, later, in the argument. To the Testament of Love, Specht adds, Chaucer did compile this book as a comfort to himself after great griefs conceived for some rash attempts of the commons, with whom he had joined, and thereby was in fear to loose the far of his best friends. Specht is also the source of the famous tale of Chaucer being fined for beating a Franciscan friar in Fleet Street, as well as a fictitious coat of arms and family tree. Ironically, and perhaps consciously so, an introductory, apologetic letter in Spets edition from Francis Beaumont defends the unseemly, low, and body bits in Chaucer from an elite, classicist position. Francis Thin noted some of these inconsistencies in his animad versions, insisting that Chaucer was not a commoner, and he objected to the friar beating story. Yet Thin himself underscores Chaucer's support for popular religious reform, associating Chaucer's views with his father William Thin's attempts to include the Plowman's Tale and the Pilgrim's Tale in the 1532 and 1542 works. The myth of the Protestant Chaucer continues to have a lasting impact on a large body of Chaucerian scholarship. Though it is extremely rare for a modern scholar to suggest Chaucer supported a religious movement that did not exist until more than a century after his death, the predominance of this thinking for so many centuries left it for granted that Chaucer was at least hostile toward Catholicism. This assumption forms a large part of many critical approaches to Chaucer's works, including Neo-Marxism. Alongside Chaucer's works, the most impressive literary monument of the period is John Fox's Acts and Monuments. As with the Chaucer editions, it was critically significant to English Protestant identity and included Chaucer in its project. Fox's Chaucer both derived from and contributed to the printed editions of Chaucer's works, particularly the Pseudepigrapha. Jack Upland was first printed in Fox's Acts and Monuments, and then it appeared in Spetz's edition of Chaucer's works. Spetz's Life of Chaucer echoes Fox's own account, which is itself dependent upon the earlier editions that added the Testament of Love and the Plowman's Tale to their pages. Like Spetz's Chaucer, Fox's Chaucer was also a shrewd or lucky political survivor. In his 1563 edition, Fox thought it not out of season to couple some mention of Geoffrey Chaucer with a discussion of John Collette, a possible source for John Skelton's character Colin Clout. Probably referring to the 1542 Act for the Advancement of True Religion, Fox said that he Marvel s to consider, how the bishops, condemning and abolishing all manner of English books and treatises which might bring the people to any light of knowledge, did yet authorize the works of Chaucer to remain still and to be occupied, who, no doubt, saw into religion as much almost as even we do now, and uttereth in his works no less, and seemeth to be a right Wycliffean, or else there never was any and that, all his works almost, if they be thoroughly advised, will testify albeit done in mirth, and covertly, and especially the latter end of his third book of the Testament of Love, wherein, except a man be altogether blind, he may espy him at the full, although in the same book as in all others he useth to do, under shadows covertly, as under a visor, he suborneth truth in such sort, as both privily she may profit at the godly minded, and yet not be a spite of the crafty adversary. And therefore the bishops, belike, taking his works but for jests and toys, in condemning other books, yet permitted his books to be read. 
It is significant, too, that Fox's discussion of Chaucer leads into his history of the Reformation of the Church of Christ in the time of Martin Luther. When printing, being opened, incontinently ministered unto the Church the instruments and tools of learning and knowledge, which were good books and authors, which before lay hid and unknown. The science of printing being found, immediately followed the grace of God, which stirred up good wits aptly to conceive the light of knowledge and judgment, by which light darkness began to be espied, and ignorance to be detected, truth from error, religion from superstition, to be discerned. Fox downplays Chaucer's body and amorous writing, insisting that it all testifies to his piety. Material that is troubling is deemed metaphoric, while the more forthright satire which Fox prefers is taken literally. John Uri produced the first edition of the complete works of Chaucer in a Latin font, published posthumously in 1721. Included were several tales, according to the editors, for the first time printed, a biography of Chaucer, a glossary of Old English words, and testimonials of author writers concerning Chaucer dating back to the 16th century. According to A. S. G. Edwards, this was the first collected edition of Chaucer to be printed in Roman type. The Life of Chaucer prefixed to the volume was the work of the Reverend John Dart, corrected and revised by Timothy Thomas. The glossary appended was also mainly compiled by Thomas. The text of Uri's edition has often been criticized by subsequent editors for its frequent conjectural emendations, mainly to make it conform to his sense of Chaucer's meter. The justice of such criticisms should not obscure his achievement. His is the first edition of Chaucer for nearly a hundred and fifty years to consult any manuscripts and is the first since that of William Thin in 1534 to seek systematically to assemble a substantial number of manuscripts to establish his text. It is also the first edition to offer descriptions of the manuscripts of Chaucer's works, and the first to print texts of Gamelin and The Tale of Baron, works ascribed to, but not by, Chaucer. Topic. Modern scholarship Although Chaucer's works had long been admired, serious scholarly work on his legacy did not begin until the late 18th century, when Thomas Tyrwhitt edited the Canterbury Tales, and it did not become an established academic discipline until the 19th century. Scholars such as Frederick James Furnival, who founded the Chaucer Society in 1868, pioneered the establishment of diplomatic editions of Chaucer's major texts, along with careful accounts of Chaucer's language and prosody. Walter William Skeet, who like Furnival was closely associated with the Oxford English Dictionary, established the base text of all of Chaucer's works with his edition, published by Oxford University Press. Later editions by John H. Fisher and Larry D. Benson offered further refinements, along with critical commentary and bibliographies. With the textual issues largely addressed, if not resolved, attention turned to the questions of Chaucer's themes, structure, and audience. The Chaucer Review was founded in 1966 and has maintained its position as the preeminent journal of Chaucer studies. Topic. In popular culture Chaucer is a major character in the 1917 opera The Canterbury Pilgrims by Reginald de Coven, which is loosely based on the Canterbury Tales. Powell and Pressburger's 1944 film A Canterbury Tale opens with a re-creation of Chaucer's Canterbury Pilgrims. The film itself takes place on the road to, and in, wartime Canterbury. The plot of the detective novel Landscape with Dead Dawns by Robert Robinson centers on the apparent rediscovery of the Book of the Leyen, and a passage from it, eleven lines of Chaucerian pastiche, turn out to be the vital murder clue as well as proving that the rediscovered poem is an elaborate, clever forgery by the murderer, a Chaucer scholar. In Rudyard Kipling's story, Dayspring Mishandled, 
A writer plans an elaborate revenge on a former friend, a Chaucer expert, who has insulted the woman he loves, by fabricating a medieval manuscript sheet containing an alleged fragment of a lost Canterbury tale, actually his own composition. Both an asteroid and a lunar crater have been named after Chaucer, although he does not appear directly in the fiction books. Chaucer is referred to as an uncle by marriage to Dame Frevis, a Benedictine nun appearing in the medieval mysteries by Margaret Fraser. A fictionalized version of Chaucer was portrayed by Paul Bettany in the 2001 movie A Knight's Tale. Topic. List of works The following major works are in rough chronological order but scholars still debate the dating of most of Chaucer's output and works made up from a collection of stories may have been compiled over a long period. Topic. Major works Translation of Roman de la Rose, possibly extant as the Romant of the Rose. The Book of the Duchess. The House of Fame. Annalita and Arcite. Parliament of Fowls. Translation of Boethius' Consolation of Philosophy as Beau. Troilus and Chryside. The Legend of Good Women. The Canterbury Tales. A Treatise on the Astrolabe Topic. Short poems An ABC Chaucer's Words Unto Adam, His Own Scrivain, Disputed The Complaint Unto Pity The Complaint of Chaucer to His Purse The Complaint of Mars The Complaint of Venus a complaint to his lady. The former age. Fortune. Gentiles. Lock of steadfastness. L'envoi de Chaucer a Scogan. L'envoi de Chaucer a Buckton. Proverbs. Belayed to Rosemounday. Truth. Womanly noblesse. Topic. Poems of doubtful authorship Against Women Unconstant A Belade of Complaint Complaint de Mors Mersela Bote The Equatory of the Planets, a rough translation of a Latin work derived from an Arab work of the same title. It is a description of the construction and use of a planetary equatorium, which was used in calculating planetary orbits and positions at the time it was believed the Sun orbited the Earth. The similar treatise on the astrolabe, not usually doubted as Chaucer's work, in addition to Chaucer's name as a gloss to the manuscript are the main pieces of evidence for the ascription to Chaucer. However, the evidence Chaucer wrote such a work is questionable, and as such is not included in the Riverside Chaucer. If Chaucer did not compose this work, it was probably written by a contemporary. Topic. Works presumed lost Of the wretched Engindringe of Mankind, possible translation of Innocent III's De Miseria Condition as Humanae. Origines upon the Modelane. The Book of the Lion. The Book of the Lion. Is mentioned in Chaucer's Retraction. It has been speculated that it may have been a redaction of Guillaume de Michaud's Dit do Lyon, a story about courtly love, a subject about which Chaucer frequently wrote. Topic. Spurious works The Pilgrim's Tale, written in the 16th century with many Chaucerian allusions. The Plowman's Tale or The Complaint of the Plowman, a Lollard satire later appropriated as a Protestant text. Pierce the Plowman's Creed, a Lollard satire later appropriated by Protestants. The Plowman's Tale, its body is largely a version of Thomas Hockleaf's 
Item de Beata Virgine. La Belle Dame sans Merci. Richard Ruse's translation of a poem of the same name by Alain Chartier. The Testament of Love, actually by Thomas U.S.K. Jack Upland, a Lollard satire. The Floor and the Leaf, a 15th century allegory. Topic. Derived works Godspeed the Plow, borrows twelve stanzas of Chaucer's Monk's Tale. Topic. See also Chaucer surname, Middle English literature John V. Fleming, eminent Chaucerian, emeritus, at Princeton University Charles Muscatine, a Chaucer scholar, deceased, formerly at University of California, Berkeley Poet-diplomat, 1890-1945